Okay, here we go. Um, so welcome everybody to the Remote Game Studio webinar. Uh, very happy to have everybody who's joined us online live and also for people who are watching the recorded version of this or the on-demand version of this, welcome as well. I'm here today with Patrick Palm, who is CEO and co-founder of Favro, and also Mike Verrett, who's development director at Unknown Worlds. Uh, and also me, myself, I'm John Leslie, I'm Agile Coach and Trainer at Broad Cove Insights. Um, so today we're going to be presenting out of Favro, uh, online collaboration and planning tool. And it's so versatile that you can even do a presentation out of it, which we've done for the past webinars and we're also doing today. So just to run through the agenda, we have what's called the board here in Favro, and this is in the timeline view. So we're going to start off with just a, a little bit more in-depth um, introduction of each one of the speakers. And then Patrick is going to take us through essentially the origin story of Favreau, how Favreau came to be. Uh, Patrick is then going to have a QA, and a a little bit of interview with Mike Verrett. Then we're going to get into more of the core of the, of the webinar today, uh, the remote game studio, kind of some of the challenges, uh, the benefits, how to overcome those challenges, um, just really kind of dive down into what's worked for studios, what hasn't worked, and, and kind of the best practices to be a successful remote game studio. And it's very apropos that Mike Verrett is with us today because Unknown Worlds, which I'm sure he'll delve into more, has been remote and distributed since day one. Uh, I'm going to then talk about a uh, kind of quick start package that Favreau and my company, Brock of Insights, have put together in partnership um, to help people transition to remote more quickly, uh, more in a more kind of seamless way if, if studios have been struggling with the move to remote, this will certainly help. And then we'll open it up to Q&A at the end. So just a little bit more, I just want to make sure that everybody realizes who's joined us and is also is watching the recorded on demand version that I'm gonna be sharing out this, what's called a collection in Fabro. I'm gonna make it a public collection. I'm gonna share it out. Everybody's gonna have access to everything I'm going through today. So don't worry about you know, taking notes or whatnot. Um, but all of these cards are clickable, right? So you click a card, you're gonna be able to see, in this example, you're gonna be able to see kind of a quick bio of Patrick, his LinkedIn um, profile, and also his company website. So all of these cards are clickable. Now, Patrick, again, is CEO and co-founder of Favro. Uh, Patrick and I have worked together for, for years now. Um, I actually found out about Handsoft, his first company, when I was working with Mike Verrett at Harmonix in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, Harmonix started using Handsoft. I was super impressed with it and ended up moving to Sweden uh, to work for Handsoft. And that was when I met Patrick Palm and we've kind of had a relationship ever since. Mike Verrett, again, development director at Unknown Worlds. He and I have known each other, I think it's since 2007, 2008, when I went to work uh, at Harmonix with him as a senior producer on the Rock Band, Rock Band franchise. He started his career um, at Iron Lore, uh, Titan Quest, you know, moved on to, to Harmonix, where he was there for many years and probably worked on every single Rock Band title uh, Beatles Rock Band, Rock Band 1, Rock Band 2, Rock Band 3, I'm sure all of them, and all their subsequent releases. And now he's moved on to Unknown Worlds, who are uh, very well known for Subnautica. And then myself, uh, I became an independent agile coach, uh, coming up on over two years now. And um, I've been working with game studios as an agile coach. I've also been working with uh, people in all sorts of different industries as an, as an Agile coach. And I'm also a certified uh, Favreau Agile partner. So I do the majority of their training and certifications. So I'm going to hand it now over to Patrick Palm. And he's going to walk us through the origin of Favreau. Uh, thanks, John. And, um, you know, the story is, um, is, is pretty straightforward. Um, you know, as, as you mentioned, you know, we worked together on, on you know, my previous company. And um, 
you know, we, we, we sold that uh, to an American company back in 2017, uh, you know, to focus on this other business, we, you know, we had just started, you know, which is, which is Favro. And Favro basically uh, builds upon, you know, three ideas, uh, you know, that we had. One was that we started to see how this uh, agile way of working was crossing over from software development into other kinds of teams. So, you know, you know marketing teams, you know, sales teams, you know, management teams, you know, basically any kind of team um, started to be interested in this. And it's not very strange because, you know, the world uh, is, uh, is, is moving, you know, fast, adapting to change is important. Um, it has become uh, brutally obvious uh, now during COVID, but, but even, you know, before COVID times and hopefully after, uh, rapidly adapting to, to, to change is, is basically what creates winners. And, you know, we, we were thinking if we can design a tool from scratch uh, that would be, uh, that would basically adapt to any kind of way of working, you know, for any different kind of team, but at the same time also connect all these dots and help the whole company with their alignment. You know, what, what would that tool look like? And that was, that was, you know, the first idea behind, behind Favre or, or Favre. You can pronounce it whatever way you want. And um, the second idea is that we saw that, you know, many of these, um, you know, frameworks for scaling agile, um, they, um, they typically work quite well in the beginning, uh, but then organizations are, are organic by nature. You know, people come, people go, you know, there are new ideas implemented. Um, so as soon as, you know, we talk about a somewhat bigger organization, it just constantly morphs in, into new shapes and forms. Um, and the, the style of, 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 of working agile in a, in, a, in a scale way, working agile across the whole organization needs to be very adaptable. You know, basically your, your scaled agile approach needs to be agile. And we thought, um, what kind of, um, you know, what would a tool look like, which is, which is not process centric, uh, which is not building on the typical kind of ideas that you see with enterprise tools, but which is actually designed, you know, for this kind of very organic, uh, you know, beast uh, that that is your your enterprise, um, and, and that is the second idea that, that we had on on, on Favro, and the third idea is very straightforward. Uh, the world has gone to cloud, um, but uh, companies are starting to demand enterprise grade security and and data governance, and this has of course become. Uh, even more topical now with, you know, GDPR, you know, with Cloud Act, um, you know, news in California, you know, the court ruling in Europe this summer, um, data governance, uh, data sovereignty, you know, those kind of questions are very top of mind for, for, for both small and large companies uh, today. So this was the third idea. And, and, you know, with our background, you know, having worked with game companies for a very long time, they're typically quite picky about these questions and also working with uh, you know, defense companies. Uh, we had a pretty good idea you know, how, how to build a tool. So we're probably one of the few um, startups um, that are able to, to operate on the level when it comes to having an enterprise grade platform uh, on, on the same level as you know, some of the, the, the biggest ones out there. So, uh, you know, the way you can think about this is basically, you know, an enterprise, enterprise grade platform, uh, you know, with a game, a great experience. You know, that's, that's really the kind of tool that we wanted to create. And, and we did. Um, and we've been very fast growing since we launched in 2016 uh, with customers in all kinds of industries, you know, any kind of teams, you know, every kind of leader uh, on different levels. And um, I think we can safe to say that the, the, the companies that are, are adopting uh, Favro, you know, tend to be quite innovation-driven companies, and they are always fun to work with. And and one of the things which is great with working with these kind of companies is that well, you meet some some really great people. Um, and in this webinar series, you know, we are inviting uh, people from our from our customers, um, you know, as, as special guests, you know, for a for a small conversation uh, before you know John gets into um, you know more practical or how to do remote work. Uh, so uh, for that reason, you know, we, we can we can invite you know you know Mike here today. However, you know we knew each other you know way back as you know John already described. So we actually didn't get to know each other uh, because of favor. We already knew each other. But um, I I actually had I didn't even I actually didn't know that 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 you had become a client. You know I I, I saw that 
you know, I know worse than become, you know, a, a customer. And then I, I don't even remember who said it. It's like, yeah, you know, it's, um, it's you know, Mike is there. Mike, Mike it's like, oh, Mike. You know, so, so I didn't have any, I can't, can't take any credit whatsoever apart from, you know, being part of creating a really great product uh, to, to, you know, that you, that you came on board. But I was very happily surprised uh, uh, when, I, when I heard that. And, and uh, I was like, well, then we have to invite him to our webinar. So here we are. Uh, that's that's the, the story leading up to, to today. So with that as a background, uh, you know, super welcome to, to the webinar here, Mike. Yeah, thanks for having me. I like it. Um, you know, it's a little bit of a reunion because I've known you guys for so long and without kind of E3 and GDC this year, a lot of those kind of, you know, coffee shop run-ins or whatever haven't been happening. So it's been a great opportunity yeah. to kind of connect with you guys and hear what's going on. And um, so, yeah, I'm happy to be around. Yeah, that, that, that is very true. And, and you know, for the ones that aren't, you know, familiar with you, you know, maybe um, a good start here would be if you could just um, kind of give us the whole, you know, backstory to how, you know, how did you get into the industry and, you know, to the, to the point uh, you know, where you're today? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, John kind of hit the high points, but in a previous life, I was actually, I got into games through audio. So I was an audio post engineer. Uh, the first half of my career, my background is music. I did sound design and uh, mixing and composition for radio and television. Um, and after doing that for about seven or eight years, um, I really started yearning for something that was more creative. A lot of TV spot work and that kind of stuff is very short term. You're banging out, you know, commercials every two or three days. Um, and I was looking at my options and one, on one side, you've got film, right, which is long format entertainment. And then there was video games and, and there was a push in the early 2000s. Um, towards better audio in games. It was like kind of a mini revolution. At least it got a lot of notice within the audio field. Like people that were doing audio professionally in other parts of entertainment really started noticing games. And I had been a gamer since I was a kid. Um, and serendipitously, as I'm kind of going through that exploration in my head, um, uh, the studio Iron Lore had reached out and they were working on a demo to try and pitch their first game, which was like a Diablo-esque sort of game. Um, and I did some demo work for them and, and then basically spent the next three years hoping that they would get a full game contract and take me on. And that eventually, and so I joined them in um, 2004 and that was sort of my first foray into, into video games. And I worked for about a year and a half with them doing audio and the studio was growing pretty rapidly. The project had gotten signed. Um, and I just tended to be a super organized person by nature and having done so much television and film work where you're constantly being thrown into really unique situations, having to adapt, having to plan uh, and still maintain a lot of creativity. Uh, they sort of asked if I would produce the game. Of course, I had no idea what that meant, but you know, I, I had done the audio thing for a long time for almost seven or eight years, 10 years at that point. And so I said, sure, I'll give this a shot. And I kind of fell in love with it. And so really from that point forward, I shifted more towards a production track and then eventually um, kind of more running, running development. So I worked at uh, Iron Lore for three or four years and they eventually unfortunately shut down um, and had friends that had started up at Harmonix. And that was a great intersection of my audio background and obviously my gaming background. And so I started there as a producer um, within a few years, I was running the production department and then six or seven years ago, I actually joined the exec team, um, kind of overseeing development of the whole studio. I was there for 13 years, which was an amazing experience. You know, I got to live through the, um, the sort of birth of the, the boom of the music game genre that went from being almost completely unknown to being a top three um, revenue generating genre in the industry in the late 2000s. Um, and then... Um, you know, after 13 years making music games, just really was getting hungry to um, work on new kinds of games and work with new teams. And I had been friends with um, the folks at Unknown Worlds for a long time. In fact, uh, one of the co-founders, Max, and I worked together at Iron Lore way back in the day. Uh, and so as I was sort of looking around for what was next, he and I happened to bump into each other and we started talking. And so um, that led to me joining the team back in March, uh, which was an interesting time to change jobs as COVID was kind of setting in globally. Um, and I, so I've been there with them for the last six months. And it's been great. They're a super, super unique uh, team to work for. Uh, awesome. And, and uh, when we've been having these, uh, these interviews uh, earlier this summer, you know, we kind of, have been we have been talking about you know the, the the fact that on one hand side um the game industry today uh is, is bigger than uh the music and uh, and film industries combined uh which is fantastic um uh, and obviously playing games is something that you know makes a lot of sense you know when it's you know these COVID times but what we have seen is is that a huge difference between studios that were quite well prepared for this or quickly adopted 
you know, to working in a, in a remote fashion. And there's been some students that just, you know, they, they, they like, they haven't, you know, released anything because they just, they get like shut down and, and, um, or, or not shut down, but you know, they've, they've really been struggling. Um, so, uh, you know, these kind of conversations we've been having this summer uh, in this webinar has been around, you know, the transition to remote work, but that's not applicable in your case, because it was like, it was like, you know, your studio was like born for this, you know, because you did this from day one. So um, maybe we can rather go into what is the background to that the studio is set up in the way it is and, and uh, you know, the, the thoughts around yeah. that. And of course, you know, if something actually changed, you know, with, with, with COVID after all. Yeah, it was um, it was super unique situation for me because Harmonics was a very brick and mortar studio, and as I think John mentioned, Unknown Worlds has been basically distributed since inception. Um, a lot of the reason for that was that they started very small, working on a game called Natural Selection, which was sort of based on a, a, a Natural Selection Two, which was based on the original Natural Selection, which was a Half Life mod. So a lot of the original studio came together from a community of sort of mod game developers, and as the studio became viable as an entity, they hired on a lot of those folks, and that game community was an international community um, mm -hmm. and so they happened to have you know different developers that were working with them on a volunteer basis very very early on that eventually became employees and they were you know very much distributed throughout the country so as the studios continued to grow they weren't tied necessarily to a specific location they're headquartered technically in the bay area in san francisco but um but um, I think as I was mentioning yesterday when we caught up very briefly, we're right now distributed across 13 countries, seven states wow. in the US and seven time zones. So, um, so, so that's, been, that's sort of been in their DNA from the very beginning. So they, uh, it took zero effort to kind of readjust to COVID from a, from a workflow standpoint. Obviously the psychological aspect of all of it has been, has been challenging as it has been for every studio. But as far as the day-to-day -day way, um, Unknown Worlds makes games. That's relatively been unchanged. Yeah. So, so there's, there's been a lot of webinars and, and similar uh, online conversations, you know, recently around, you know, so 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 how do we how do we transition to this? You know, not only ones that we have hosted, you know, uh, the investors are hosting and, and conferences that have now been going online. They tend to have a topic around this, and I find that one of the questions that seems toughest for people to, to have a solution to is the time zone difference. Yeah. And, and you mentioned that was, that was really part of the DNA here from the beginning. I, could you just go a little bit deeper on exactly, um, you know, to, to handle the, the, the time zone thing? Because I think, I think everyone's really wanting to hear a good answer to that. Yeah, um, I guess just to sidebar for that super briefly, um, I was having this conversation, not specifically about time zones, although it's super related with a colleague of mine at Harmonix. And he had this amazing analogy, which I think is super relevant here, is that when you're working with everybody in the same place, especially from a project leadership standpoint, he's sort of akin to hunting, right? You need a piece of information, you need something, the team is right there, you go to the team, you get what you need, basically, and you can move forward and you can control that process because everybody is right there. And he said, when you start working distributed, it's a little more like fishing. You need things and you throw your lines out and you wait for someone to respond to your email to get back to your Slack and you can't control that timeline as much. So what happens is you tend to have to spread out and you start managing multiple threads. Um, and what starts to happen is something that's sort of, I, I guess I would describe more as like asynchronous development where mm -hmm. everyone is making the same game together, but not always exactly the same time. Um, and I think that really is the trick to think about when you're thinking about managing all this work. And I, I don't actually think it's as much as a tool and process thing as it is a culture thing within the studio. Um, you know, as I started spending more time at Unknown Worlds and getting to know the team, um, there were these very unique elements that I hadn't really seen anywhere else in terms of the high level of ownership in the games they were making and the way they were making those games across the entire studio. And everyone was... Um, was sort of very versatile, very T-shaped in that way, because they right. got so used to needing to constantly be able to unblock themselves and move development forward, even if the person they're working closest with is eight hours behind them or six hours in front of them. Um, and I think that's led to a really unique culture where, um, where because of that high level of ownership and that high level of accountability, they're, they're able to kind of make that work. Whereas I think studios coming into this for the first time that are used to hunting and not fishing, Mm -hmm. are, are need to learn those lessons and figure out how to not just change their tools and their process, but start adapting their culture to, to be more flexible in that way. You, you know, you, you said, uh, you said, you said accountability and, and kind of, you know, owning it. I, I think that is very spot on. Um, 
if we look at this uh, uh, from, a, from a leadership point of view, would you say that it also affects the way that you set goals? Because I guess, you know, if you have a culture where, you, you know, managers are very, very hands-on, you know, I don't want to say micromanaging, but as mm -hmm. close to that as you can get, it's going to be extremely hard. Um, you know, well, basically in, in, in a, you know, asynchronous way of working, you know, that just doesn't work. So you, you need to, you know, set goals that, uh, you know, teams and, and people can autonomously, you know, uh, deliver uh, on. Yeah, that goal, goals is huge. And, and trust is another one, I think, and, and almost equally or sometimes more important. And that's something that, um, you know, I, I worry that a lot of people don't give enough thought to as they're kind of making these kind of transitions is that because of the multiple time zones and because you're not there in the same building, you know, and, and I, I think there's a little bit of a fallacy in that everyone believes, oh, if you're working there and your manager's right there, you know what's going on because they can walk by and they can see what's on your screen. And I think that provides a sort of false sense of security a lot of times. You know, mm -hmm. you don't know that that person is necessarily working productively or whatever. But when you're in this remote situation, you don't have that false sense of security. You don't have that safety net. There's a lot of trust that the person out there in whatever part of the world they're doing their work is getting their work done and that the people that are going to wake up in four hours and go to work have what they need there. And so I, I think that um, both being able to set and clearly talk about goals is important and trusting that everyone is going to then take those tools and take those goals and, and be able to work together and move the product forward is e equally as important. So um, I, I'm going to, you know, test the statement with you here now and see, sure. see if you agree. So, so, you know, when, when we designed, uh, you know, Favreau and, you know, you know, our kind of philosophies behind it is, is to enable, you know, autonomy, you know, and alignment. So obviously, you know, the whole kind of, you know, philosophy around, you know, if you want to call it OKRs or, or whatever, but, you know, really setting, you know, uh, goals on a, on a somewhat higher level, having teams, you know, autonomously working towards that, uh, you know, managing flow rather than tasks, you know, visualizing mm -hmm. that flow, so forth. You know, all of these principles that are, are um, you know, quintessentially agile principles, you know, it's, it's what we've, you know, built this tool upon. Um, the statement I would like to try with you is that, you know, now in this, in this situation, it is really kind of a shit hits the fan situation because, you know, you might, you might have, you know, leaders that, that talk about these values, but if you in practice def have more of a traditional command and control culture in, in mm -hmm. management, you know, you, I, I guess that is going to be brutally um, uh, clear now, <laughs> you know, how, how, how that falls apart uh, versus if you're, uh, in a place where, where, you know, you might not even use those kind of words. You might just say, hey, we trust our team. Um, and, and that's the fanciest word you, you put on it. Um, you know, you, you, know you, you went into this, this period and, and it worked fine. Um, does this resonate with you or do you think I got that wrong? Yeah, no, I, I, th I think, I think that's, that's probably right. I think in some ways this is where COVID may have helped the industry adapt because everybody's going into this with a lot of empathy for what everybody's dealing with, right? So if it was more like a company decided we're going to make this change and, the, and mm -hmm. the rest of the context wasn't there, they may not have been as flexible and as willing to adapt as they've needed to be because they didn't really have a choice in this case, right? Everybody was more or less in the same boat in, in almost all the countries where everyone had to shift. And so I think because of that extra level of empathy that was out there and that extra level of, you know, everyone needing to adapt, I think that really yeah. helped people maybe take more risk, maybe listen to more and look more carefully at what was going on and reevaluate their own process as opposed to directly coming in and saying like, okay, this is the way we worked in the same building. Now we're going to basically figure out what version of this has to happen at home. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think, I think with, with that, with that exception, I think I, I kind of, ag I, I agree with what you're saying is that, that there has yeah. to be change on a lot of different fronts for that to work. You know, it, it, what you're saying is, you know, tying, tying well into, you know, an old truth around, you know, change management. It's extremely hard to, to change an organization if you're, if you're not in pain. You know, it, it requires a crisis for you to, to mm -hmm. actually, uh, you know, if you, if you go to T, I don't know if you read the book, The Innovator's Dilemma, um, mm -hmm. which, is, which is a fantastic read. And, and basically the whole book is about that, you know, changing things when there's a crisis, that, that's actually not the hard thing. If you're trying to to reinvent yourself when things are going well, that is ridiculously hard. And uh, you know, here are some tips for how you can do that. It's 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 a fantastic read. Um, so so speaking about culture, um, I mean, you, you know, you mentioned um, you know harmonics being more of a of a kind of you know brick and mortar um, you know situation. And I remember when I visited there, you know, there was um, 
my impression was that it was a, it was a very strong culture. Uh, but I would I would also guess that the culture is very much you know built in kind of you know a face to face situation over over a long time. Now you know with the with the students like Anna Worlds where where you know you have a you're distributed from from the beginning. You know how how do you how do you develop culture and and how do you think that maybe have affected what culture is for you? Yeah, it's it's interesting because I had I, I had to you know I had to coming into the role I was coming into, um, I had to sort of learn very quickly what was, what was um, sort of in the special sauce, right? What allowed them to make a game like Sonatica? How did they make it? Um, and I think what I really learned is that um, there were two things. The studio really, really develops openly with the public and has for a very long time, going all the way back to, to even when they were working on natural selection. Um, they have always sort of done everything in kind of an open access format. They've always valued the community. They've always built the game with the community. Um, and I guess to kind of put my plug in for Favreau here, that's been a great tool for doing that because we've been able to um, make boards public and be able to show parts of our backlog publicly and bugs publicly and kind of work and get that feedback. And that's been, that's been really helpful. So I think, I think the desire to um, continue to develop with the people playing the games has been a huge, a, a huge thing. And, and um, because they've prioritized that, I think that's allowed them to develop their own sort of sets and rules and policy around what's important to them. And that's the thing that's important to them and has, has shaped the culture over, over the years. Um, I think the other thing is just this idea that um, that everybody has so much impact on the game. You know, traditionally they have not been a studio that's used producers, and they don't have a lot of people in what I would call like a system designer role. There, they have creative leads at the head of projects, they have level designers building levels, but they don't really have anyone there whose specific job is to design the game. That's kind of a shared responsibility, and I think that's where a lot of the ownership comes from. Um, and I'm still learning a little bit about how that works there, but I would say that those two things are probably some of the things that have created the elements about what makes that opportunity or that culture so unique there is that they don't have um, people in roles whose job it is to always make those decisions. And so a lot of that falls back to the team. Uh, yeah, and when that, when, when that happens, there's just a lot of ownership. Yeah, sorry, John. It, it goes back to what you said about T-shaped. Yeah. Uh, it, it's that whole concept of, you know, I'm not just an animator or I'm not just a software engineer. I'm, I'm actually a game developer. And, and you, that's, that's just going to build much more, like you say, a sense of ownership of the entire process. Yeah, no, no, totally. And I think that, you know, I think they have um, valued that since they were very small at the beginning. And as they've grown and are continuing to grow, it is one of the things that everyone in the studio uniformly make sure that we maintain as we continue to evolve as a studio, you know, and one of the first things I did when I joined was I like interviewed everybody at the company, you know, what's important about this place? What do we have to make sure we preserve? And unanimously, it was those things. We should be making games with our players. We should be making sure that everybody's voice is heard on the team and that everyone feels like they, they were part of this and not just someone who made this little piece. Um, and I think, you know, and that, that becomes very, very difficult to do when you're, when you're a much, much larger studio and you're accomplishing really, a, you know, ambitious titles with the scope of world that, you know, massive games have. But, you know, that said, uh, Subnautica is an open world survival game with a, with a, with a you know, like a 20-ish hour storyline, really. And that constitutes, in my mind, a, a you know, pretty big scoped game. And they were able to do that with a fairly small team. Um, um, you know, using that sort of bag of tricks that they developed over the years and quite successfully, you know, the, out, the output of that was it's done, the game's done really well. It's a very, you know, very well put together game. It's a great experience um, and innovative and unique, you know, within that sort of genre. Um, so, and I, I think a lot of that is attributed to culture. They have a great team, but that, mm. that team has built that culture at the studio and, um, and they're very, very aware of what they have and protecting that as the studio evolves, I would say. If I may, uh, Mike, is it, what's is there a hierarchy, or or what is it, the hierarchy? It's very very flat, um, to be honest. You know, I think that the project teams have a sort of a game director, creative director role, and there's you know usually someone who's the sort of senior engineer on the project, and there's an art director on the project. But outside of that, it, it's really really flat, and people kind of integrate very organically. Like I joined the studio, sort of as the development director, and we continue to refine what that means based on me getting to understand how they want to work and how they want to grow. Um, but it's, it's, everybody's pretty accepting of like, okay, what do we need to do? What's the most important thing to go back 
back to um, you know uh, Patrick's point about goal-driven development. What are we trying to accomplish in two months, and three months, and five months in the next year? What do we need to do to get there? Um, that's the conversation we tend to have, not sort of like, well, who's in what position and where do we have to put them to be most effective? It's all about what are we trying to get done and, and how do we leverage the talent we have to do that? And a lot less about people's title and, and sort of position they're in within the studio or within a project. I, um, I like what you said about um, using uh, uh, the, the public collection uh, functionality of Favreau and I, I, I also very much, you know, like the, I saw your, your, your Trello board, which is all have one card. Uh, we moved to Favreau. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> That's great. I didn't, I didn't but, know but, they had but, done that. That's funny. Yeah. 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 But you're not the only ones. I actually seen quite a few of those. Um, so, so that, 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 that's great. That's great. Um, so just to wrap up a little bit, you know, I, I, uh, I kind of want to just go a little bit more in, in, into, into, you know, uh, Favreau and, and, um, what are the specific, um, you know, challenges that, that, that has been addressed, you know, you know, using, using power just to get a little bit of kind of a case, um, yeah. case examples here. Um, well, I mean, one of my favorite ones, I'm actually going to jump backwards on my timeline and experience with the product is that um, when I was at Harmonix, we made a game called Drop Mix, which was a collaboration with Hasbro. Uh, and it was pretty interesting in that it was a collectible card game that was done on a board. Um, and the cards all had, um, NFC chips in them. And so you would drop cards on the board and it, would gen it was like a music generator and card game. And um, when we were working on the look and the, and the visual idea of the game, we really wanted all, every card as in any collectible card game to be super unique visually. And um, the way we approached that was we went off and hired um, all independent concept artists and illustrators to do the cards. So instead of using our internal art team and had a small number of artists making a lot of cards, we basically decided we were going to use a large number of artists across all different styles of art. Um, and, um, and we used Favreau to track all that. And a lot of it was due somewhat to the, to the flexibility of the product, as you kind of mentioned earlier, but a lot of it was how visual it can be, especially when using art. So we were able to like really make every image the front and center point of each Favreau card and to see it go through the pipeline and through art, you know, all the art direction was done on the card. Um, w w within in the Favreau card on the actual art card and we were able to move um, I think we had 50 or 60 uh, contract artists all working on that project each doing a handful of cards and so we just had this massive Favreau board you know with 50 lanes on it with like 300 cards all, all, all moving through development uh, on the project it was pretty it was pretty awesome cool um, and then, That's you know, I went to the performance of Favreau, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> which, which I know doesn't kind of speak uh, to, to the remote piece because we were doing that when we were all in one building. Although to be honest, all of those contract artists were remote and they were in, we were able to communicate effectively with that many folks all at the same time and track that much work in parallel, which, um, which is a kind of a unique situation because usually if you're outsourcing art, you're doing it with one company and you're dealing with an art manager and art director over there, who's then directing that team. And we, individually basically built an outsource army and, and we're directing that internally. And we basically had one, um, one of our lead concept artists was managing all of, all of that work. Um, and, and Fabro was a big tool for that. Um, you know, in Unknown Worlds, I think it's still those two pillars that we leverage the most, the accessibility um, and flexibility of the product in terms of being able to let every team work a little bit differently. And um, the, the, you know, Unknown Worlds develops very organically. And so, for example, if a strike team spins up to solve a problem during a milestone, it's very easy to like, oh, you know what, we're just going to go and create a board for this and put all the work there. And it doesn't conform to like a strict agile methodology where you would have to configure your project to match the way agile is supposed to be done by the book. You're basically able to kind of, the tool supports breaking the rules in a lot of these nice ways, I think. Um, and, and the visual aspect, which I mentioned before, harmonics comes into play all, all the time. You know, I think it's just great to be able to, um, one of the things that's most important with a distributed team is visibility into the progress that everyone else is making. And when you can have current work surfaced on the card and visible during standup, it's, it's just a great way to get the game in front of the team when people can tend to be siloed and working on their own features. And so I think that's another, that's another piece of it that's been really useful and, and, and helpful for us. All right. Super. And I, I think this is a good segue over to, uh, to John's part when the, you know, looking a bit, you know, concretely at, at some uh, uh, great practices for, for working in distributed fashion and, and doing so uh, using, using Favreau. Uh, you know, Mike, always a pleasure. I, I can't wait to get out of, even though we're talking about, you know, distributed uh, work here, you know, I can't wait to get out of the, you know, Corona's 
thing and we can we can we can actually have a have a beer together um and we get you know back to our gdc's and everything even though i think i would actually guess that many conferences are probably going to keep a much stronger online part because i think some conferences have actually got better uh by by being run online and they have a bigger audience and, and yep. so so there's, there's definitely a lot of good stuff that is coming out of this crisis um of course a lot of bad stuff too but 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 there are you know Whatever, whatever problem there, there is also opportunity for 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 good things to happen. Yeah. Uh, so super sure. thanks. You know, feel free to 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 stick around. Uh, you know, during during you know John's part. Um, uh, and um, you know, see you see you later. Over to you, John. Okay. Thanks, Patrick and Mike. Uh, thanks very much. You know, that was uh, we've we've done a lot of these this summer, as Patrick said, and this is the most notes I've taken of any <laughs> of the guests. Because <laughs> I talk too much. I just talk too much. That's the problem. It was, it was, it was just good quality stuff. I mean, I t completely agree with the T-shaped and, you know, getting that fast feedback, trying, you know, working with the actual players as you're developing. I mean, those things are so key. And, and above and beyond Agile, it just makes sense. And, I mean, you guys are in such a unique position to, to be okay Right, with this move to remote because you already were. Yeah. Uh, and I remember even back at Harmonix, I was learning from you. I, we were having some sort of debate about, you know, what's a, what's a backlog supposed to be like in, in Handsoft at the time. And you were totally right. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, you continue to, yeah, I continue to learn from you. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. I really appreciate it, John. Um, yeah, so for uh, the people joining, um, be sure to you know, make use of the Q&A button down there at the bottom, the chat. If you have anything you want to ask uh, Mike specifically or just a general question, just you know, feel free to use those. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen once again, and we'll get back to Favreau. And again, one of the, and, and I'm sure Mike can attest to this, uh, one of the things that's very unique about Favreau right out of the gate is that it's not like a Trello and in, in where you can only have a single board per screen. Okay, so you can have as many boards and as many backlogs and you know, most people are familiar with the backlog if you've done any sort of agile development on a single screen collection. So, for example, if um, you know, I move over to this producer dashboard, this can literally be a collection of roadmaps and timeline view. You know, I can have sprint boards. Um, I can switch to sheets views on the, on the fly. Um, and all of this can exist, which I think is so important when you're talking about collaborating across multiple teams. Um, all of the backlogs of the multiple teams uh, in a single screen collection, right? And, and this is right out of the gate, the biggest, I think, differentiator between Favreau and any other online collaboration and planning tool out there. Um, but to get more into kind of the remote game studio and the challenges, the benefits and solutions, um, open up this board. And when, as Patrick said during the introductions, when this whole, when the pandemic hit and the whole world was locking down and everybody was moving to remote, um, we had a great conversation about, you know, what's it gonna look like? What's the world gonna look like? And how can we help, right? And one of the inspirations for doing this webinar series and writing the articles that we wrote and putting together some of the videos that we wrote to help with this was this quote from Martin Mikos, uh, who's CEO of HackerOne and also a Favreau investor. But he wrote this open letter to the world when the pandemic hit and, and his company, HackerOne, had been essentially remote first from the beginning kind of like unknown worlds, but they still had a, an office brick and mortar presence. But then they quickly made, and it was very easy for them to make the move to remote hundred uh, percent. And he had this quote, which really resonated with myself and Patrick in that open letter to the world, essentially. The industrial revolution brought us the idea that work is a place different from home and that work is done in physical proximity of many other people. It is the idea of the joint workplace that is the anomaly working from home is natural. Now, some people might, might disagree with that. Some might agree with that. But, but the point being is that, you know, 
during the Industrial Revolution, when everybody had to come together and work in factories, you had to be in the same physical space. Now with knowledge work, making games, for example, you don't, and Unknown Worlds has proven this, you don't necessarily have to be in the physical, same physical space. You don't have to be co-located teams. And, and in a lot of ways too, it, it's much, it is more natural to work from home. Um, if, if you don't have interruptions, which you know, we all do, especially have kids, um, but you're much better able to control those interruptions. And speaking of interruptions, that leads to the second quote that really inspired us uh, by Jason Fried and David Hansen, who wrote the book Remote back in 2013. They're also the co-founders of 37 Signals, the guys who make Basecamp. But they say about offices that offices have become interruption factories. The ability to be alone with your thoughts is in fact one of the key advantages of working remotely. And this really resonated with me because I'd worked as a game producer uh, for years in multiple different companies, multiple different studios, including harmonics with Mike. And um, the, the offices, the studios became more and more, you know, open plan. And with that open plan, everybody sitting next to each other, you're thinking you're going to be able to collaborate better. Um, you know, it really just became more of an interruption factory where in order for a software engineer to get anything done, you'd see them putting on their headphones. Um, and, and still there were these constant interruptions. And when you really get real work done, you have to have uninterrupted time to focus. And you have that time obviously at home, or at least you can control those interruptions much better at home. Or for me, I actually, you know, to, to completely control remote interruptions. I was working from my home office for the past few months, um, but with the return to school being mostly homeschooling still, at least here in Maine, um, I decided to get uh, a private office. And, you know, it, if you can swing that, I highly, highly recommend it because it's, it's an even better way to work remotely together with the people you collaborate with. Um, so some of the benefits, and some of these benefits, you know, at least the first one here is obvious. Uh, so if you're running a studio, a large studio in particular, or even a small studio, you're going to have much lower overhead. If you continue to be a remote game studio, even after the pandemic is over, right? So um, reduced overhead as far as office space and rent, no utilities. You don't have to worry about things like office furniture, office insurance. Uh, the maintenance stuff, facility stuff, security stuff, so on and so forth. You know, travel, although I used to travel a ton and I do kind of miss it, I don't miss it that much. And those travel costs are obviously greatly reduced as well. I mean, we've proven with Zoom and tools, tools like Favro and Slack um, that you can actually collaborate just as effectively, if not more effectively, remotely because you don't have those interruptions. Uh, we wrote, I wrote this article uh, before the pandemic actually about how to run your entire game studio in a single tool, which happens to be Favro. Again, there's a link to it in the card in this collection that I'm gonna share out with everybody. But it really kind of details how, instead of having that physical space, Favro can essentially become your game studio. It's that virtual space or online space, cloud-based space, whatever you want to call it, where the entire game studio comes together, it becomes a single source of truth. You can integrate it with other tools, but it's that one stop, where do I go to get those questions answered? Because I can't go and tap on somebody's shoulder. And it puts it in relation to where the work is happening, which we'll see in a couple of examples. Um, kind of a side effect of, of moving to remote and Mike Verrett has certainly called this out, right? He said, uh, I believe it was 13 countries. Unknown Worlds has individual contributors in 13 countries in seven different states, um, obviously all over the world. And, and that came together naturally because they're working as, as a mod, you know, working on a Half-Life mod. But it's amazing to me that they maintain that. And I think they probably maintain that because of this single truth right here. You're able to get the best talent, regardless of geographic location. You're able to, you're able to find the people who are passionate about the project, you know, have, have the best skills, 
maybe even T-shaped skills suited to developing that particular game or IP or whatever the case may be. And, it, and it's completely geography independent, right? Um, you don't have to have somebody relocate to maybe a very expensive city like San Francisco or LA, and, and maybe they have no interest in living in San Francisco or LA. I myself, you know, moved from San Francisco uh, when I was working for a company um, and became independent and I moved to Maine. And I've been able to, you know, work with companies. And I, I just did some training for a company in Dubai. Um, literally can work and collaborate with people all over the world from, from a place that I enjoy living, which is here in Portland, Maine. So one example of another kind of benefit of this that goes along with the best talent is diversity. And we've had many guests over the summer who this is a hot topic for them. Um, they want more diversity in games, whether it's gender or ethnicity or geographic location, whatever the case may be. We're more and more making games, not for hardcore gamers, we're, make, we're making games for the entire world, right? Um, especially online games. We're making games for an incredibly diverse group of people. And to bring that diversity into the team that's actually developing that experience is more and more key, more and more essential. So just because now that you can literally hire people from all over the world to become part of your remote game studio, um, that diversity is much e easier to bring into the team. And just a quick example of this process in Favro, and this is really kind of to illustrate too that concept of Favro isn't just for production. It's not just for feature development or art asset creation, although you can certainly you know, use it for that. Um, the idea of an of a agile game studio or a remote game studio is everything has to happen in the tool that you're using to, to plan and collaborate with together, including recruitment. So this is just an example of that, right? You can, you can have all the selected resumes over here and as these people move through from screening to team interviews, uh, they pass the team interviews and then you do the reference check all the way through to who eventually gets hired, right? That can all be tracked and, and visualized in a tool like Favro. And you can have additional boards again, like in the same screen collection, open job positions, applicant sheet, whatever the case may be. So another key uh, benefit, and I'm working as an agile coach with other game studios uh, directly, and it's, it's just simply happier teams. And I think Unknown Worlds has probably experienced this way before the pandemic where you know, when you have that autonomy, when you have that trust, when you feel like you're actually a game developer on a, big, on a team of game developers, as opposed to I'm pigeonholed into a, my specific discipline, it just creates a happier individual contributor, happier people, and happier people obviously make happier teams. And that's been proven time and time again to lead to increased creativity, innovation, and productivity. And, and so, those physical, those very expensive, expensive physical studios might have actually been a detriment to your collaboration, to your team happiness, to your creativity and your productivity. And in that kind of concept of continuous improvement of happiness, team happiness, uh, I have an example here of what's called a Kazen backlog in Favro. So instead of a backlog of feature improvements or feature features or a backlog of art assets. This is instead generated from your retrospectives, which you can do, of course, in Favro. And all of these improvement items would feed this backlog where these improvement items to make the team happier, to make the team more productive, whatever those improvement items might be, um, can all be prioritized to simply drag and drop here in this case what's called a case and backlog and that can either be feeding an actual team sprint board um, where if you want to track these improvement items with the actual feature user stories or the art assets um, on a sprint board or a kanban board or you can have a separate case and board where the idea is you're making sure that the, the, the improvement items that come out of your retrospectives are, are actually getting done you're actually making those improvements and so that's just as important, that idea of continuous improvement on your teams is just as important 
is actually getting the work done, is actually you know, creating that value for your players. Um, and of course, you know, obviously one of the biggest uh, advantages of moving to remote is it's, it's just instantly wiped out everybody's commute. You don't have to commute anymore. You don't have to spend like we do in the US, the average to 304 hours per year in a car stuck in traffic, especially in the LA's, you know, the Bay Area locations, um, your bigger cities, right? Where a lot of game studios, a lot of businesses in general happen, most typically are located. So that commute is just gone. You get that three to 400 hours per year back. And that's obviously contributing to the work-life balance that everybody's been talking about for years. Um, and the, and the team happiness and the individual contributor happiness. So those are some of the benefits, the challenges. Mike mentioned this, um, and I think, you know, brilliant example is studio culture, right? You can have all the process, you can have all the best process in the world, the best tools. Um, if you don't have that studio culture, which Unknown Worlds just has by nature, because it happened at birth, inception of the company, that culture of trust, that culture of autonomy, right? That is so important. And one of the things that you know, I realized right away, observing companies that I work with as an agile coach, um, is that the move to remote is gonna amplify not only your strengths that I know worlds certainly had, um, but also the weaknesses. And the weaknesses, if you have a very command and control culture, if um, you have producers tasking out individual contributors, whether they're software engineers or artists, that's just not gonna work in a remote environment. It, it was probably painful in a co-located space and really kind of uh, detrimental to um, morale or happiness of the teams, but it, it just won't even work in a remote environment. You have to have that trust. You have to have that autonomy. You have to trust that the work is gonna get done and that people are actively contributing to whatever titles you're working on. So um, Agile is obviously great for that. Agile has been a big component of Agile is transparency, trust, courage, uh, all those things that make good Agile teams. So this move to remote, you know, if you're, if you're struggling with it, it's probably because not, not so much the tools of the process, but it's probably more so as Mike Verrett called out in the beginning of this webinar, the studio culture and that studio culture obviously has to change. So to help with that, um, we wrote, uh, Patrick and I in collaboration wrote this Fabro Remote Work Playbook, which, which touches on the culture issues and how to strengthen that culture. Um, we also have, uh, you know, the idea of, uh, we want to maintain the, the, the friendships as well as the collaboration with our colleagues. And, uh, and a kind of an example we put together is this, um, this concept of instead of meeting at the restaurant or going to a bar together after work or your after works, having your after works in online games. I mean, you're making games, you're playing games anyway, keep that going and create a discord hub. And this, this article here walks through how Favro has done that and how it's been a great kind of, we work in Favro and when we're done with work and we want to meet up socially for our after works, uh, we meet in Discord, there's a Favro Discord server, and, and we play games together, and it's brilliant. And uh, this is just an example of that collection that we used to figure out what games we're going to play and kind of the game calendar um, in, of course, the tool. So, you know, right away when, when people move, make the move to remote, it's this fear that people are gonna take advantage of it and they're not gonna do anything, right? Um, or the fear of how do I even, if I, if I was a command and control tech producer, a command and control leader, uh, manager in the company before, uh, my natural instinct is going to be, how do I track activity? You know, how do I track tasks? How do I tell if they're even online or not, right? Um, and that's, that's just, again, goes back to the studio culture thing. You obviously don't have trust if you feel like you have to track online activity and, and tasks, for example. 
Um, and the, the analogy in Agile that's often used is in a relay race, it's much more effective to keep the eyes on the baton than the individual runners. You know, the whole concept in an agile studio is we don't care so much about individual allocations of who's busy, who's, who's under over allocated, who's under allocated. Um, do we have enough as a, of this particular discipline to get this particular amount of work done? Of course you have to have some of that, but you should rather, instead of be watching how, you know, busy people are, you should be watching the flow of value. So our features moving quickly from idea to actual release to the customer, to the players, right? Are they moving quickly through sprints? And being able to visualize and track that flow of value is super important and way more effective, especially in a remote environment than tracking the individual contributors or employees. And so just an example of that in Favro, um, this is maybe a small mobile game app team or a supporting app for your game. And, and they have their own sprint boards. And on these sprint boards, you can turn on flow-based metrics like time on board and time on column. So I can see how long has stats tracking, for example, been in, on this board. This is, of course, demo data, so these numbers are ridiculous. But um, you, can have, you can see, okay, this particular feature stats tracking has been on this board for 63 days. It's been in this column for five hours. If I move it here, you know, I can see that maybe it moved from test back to in progress. When I move it back to test, you can see it was in test for a ridiculously long time. But the idea being is that you're able to track and visualize not only the flow of your cards, features in this case, could also be art assets, but you're also able to see how long things have been on the board, how long have they been in progress in total, and how long have they been at any particular stage. And built into each one of these Favro boards are flow-based metrics like burn down charts. So you can see how you're tracking towards completion what you, for what you completed in a sprint or at least for example. Um, there's also cumulative flow charts and control charts, especially if you're into a more of a Kanban type way of working. So using a tool like Favro, not only can you visualize your work, but you get all these flow-based metrics for free just by moving the cards and working in this way. Okay, um, another one that I hear quite often as an agile coach is we have way, we had too many meetings before, but now we have even more meetings. And um, you know, a guy at Bonfire Studios that I've been working with as an agile coach said, it's too many meetings this is the actual problem. It's just a symptom of the real problem. And the real problem is, is that, as Mike Verrett so aptly pointed out at the beginning of this webinar, there's probably a lack of clear goals and direction. Now, if you don't have that, those clear goals and direction and you can't visualize the work, um, then there's gonna be a lot of questions. You're, you're not gonna know what it is you're supposed to be working on. So remove that. You've gotta provide the clear goals, whether it's in a backlog or you know, the, the creative director or whoever's providing the overall vision, making sure that the, the goals, the intent is clear, and then trust the teams to make it happen. And you have to be able to see not only what you're working on and not only what your team is working on, but what the entire studio is working on. Um, another uh, kind of handy tip and trick is, you know, make sure you create a, a cadence of meetings and make that cadence of meetings very visual to the entire studio. And here's an example of that in Favro, where you might have a studio online meetings calendar. Uh, these are maybe the per team meetings and when they're happening and how long for each day. And maybe these are the company wide meetings that are happening um, on a weekly basis. So determine that cadence, make that cadence very visual. And just by having um, a proper daily standup, for example, not a status update, but in a proper daily standup where the team's collaborating and setting essentially the plan for the day and adapting to what happened the previous, based on what happened the previous day, that's gonna remove a ton of the ad hoc, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing uh, type of meetings that, that so often pop up on demand. Uh, collaboration and innovation. So as Mike 
again, pointed out with unknown worlds, and it was awesome hearing that uh, as an example, because they have been remote and distributed from day one. You know, they've obviously proven that you can make an amazing product, an amazing game like Subnautica, uh, and and have a completely co non collated located team, completely remote, completely distributed. So those fears, you know, should be should go away, and and it, it might be painful to go from co-located to remote, but if you're using good tools and you have a good culture and you have good process, it's certainly not impossible. And you might actually end up making better games than you made when you were co-located. So one of the real problems with um, a large game with a large team isn't just collaboration at the team level, it's collaboration across the teams. So the teams of teams level. And to show an example of that here in Favreau, um, we've got this feature team, this fictional feature team. They're working out of a, their own feature backlog here. And they get, they have this feature take cover behind objects. And there's embedded QA and, and the QA analyst who's working on this um, is blocked, right? He realizes uh, I don't have the proper block model or the proper asset or, or combination of assets that I need to properly test this feature, this user story, take cover behind objects. So he's going to say that he's blocked, right? He can write it just in text here why he's blocked. He can have a conversation as I pre-filled in here with the person who can help remove that impediment. But more so, he can just simply maybe have a block column and there's um, workflow rules and restrictions built into each board where you can automate the flow. So I can say, as soon as I move from testing in the blocked, I want to automatically tag it as blocked. I want to color the card red, making it again, very visual that something is blocked. And they also want to auto assign maybe the team lead, or if you're using scrum, the scrum master, um, the person responsible for removing that impediment. Right. So it automatically tagged the card, colored it, and, and assigned the person responsible. So that person responsible, you can bring in boards from other teams' collections. So that guy could bring in, uh, he knows who needs to do it. It's the internal art asset team who needs to create that block model. So this tester, this feature tester can be uh, unblocked. So you can bring in that board. That board is here. You can see what that team is working on. And since the cards can exist in multiple places, as well as the boards and backlogs of Fabro existing in multiple places, you can simply, he could simply take that card and not move it, but rather add it to the internal art, art asset teams collection. So you can see via what are called relations on the card that this feature team is blocked, right? And we can see from on this side, because it's the same card, that this particular card or, or feature, which needs this block model, is then selected for the internal art asset Kanban team. And when it moves to sketch like this, you can see that represented here. So this team can see how this thing is progressing towards actually getting it done and removing this block, removing this impediment. Eventually, it's going to move through all the stages to maybe review. The team swarms it moves that block model into in-game, the person here responsible for removing that impediment is going to say, okay, this is ready. He can move this back to testing. It automatically removes the block tag, retags it as back in testing, and maybe even reassigns it to the QA analyst who was blocked in the first place. So it's lots of automation built into the boards. Um, so easy to, to handle cross-team impediments or dependencies and do that cross team collaboration, just because you don't have to jump between different single screen collections for each team to see what they're working on and share work between those team boards. You can do it all in a single screen collection live in real time. Okay, so um, getting to some of the, more of the solutions to, to the actual challenges, right? So the studio, culture. Um, you've got to remove, move to this remote first studio culture. And, and I would argue, even if you do go back to a physical studio, it's good to have this, this type of mindset, right? So you, you've got to build that sense of trust and accountability. 
Um, we trust you to, we pass along the intent, what's the goal, and you're a skilled person, that's why we hired you in the first place. We're not gonna tell you how to do it, we're just gonna trust you to make that happen. And that moves into this whole concept, agile concept of servant leadership, where um, the goal of a, a leader in an agile organization isn't, isn't command and control. It's not, um, you know, the boss, the stereotypical boss. It's just somebody who has to be able to clearly articulate and, and pass along the intent. What are the goals? What is it we're trying to do this sprint or try to do this milestone or try to do, trying to achieve this release? You know, what are the expected outcomes, so to say, or objectives as opposed to here's the output that you need to create? It's just, what's the goal? And let the team determine how to achieve that goal. Um, and for the individual contributors, you know, for whether you're an, an animator or an artist or a software engineer, there's no physical space to show up to before, like, like there used to be, right? So how do, you, how do you show that you're working, right? It, it used to be just because you were there means, means well, you're working. Um, but that's not true anymore. So now you have to, as an individual contributor, you have to adapt and change your mindset to, um, I am an autonomous person and all this responsibility is on me now and I have to add value. I have to show that I'm adding value and that's how you show up in a remote organization, in a re remote game studio. And that's certainly how Unknown Worlds, as it sounds like, has operated since day one. The, there's nobody there to tell you what to do and how to do it. You have to figure it out yourself. You have to maybe become more T-shaped, meaning even though you are maybe a software engineer, you have to become more design focused or more QA focused on top of what you already do to unblock, as Mike so aptly pointed out again, your own impediments and, and add that value on a daily basis. So much more of a entrepreneurial or business owner mindset as opposed to an employee mindset. And of course, you have to provide transparency and visibility, not just at the team level, not just at the team of teams level, but for the entire studio. And it's this whole idea, we talk about business agility, there's also this concept in game development of studio agility, overall studio agility, um, which we'll talk about in a second. But just to give an example of transparency at the studio level, I have the studio initiatives backlog or studio initiatives dashboard. So this could be something that's shared to the entire studio. Um, everybody can see maybe the overall, what are the overall goals, high level goals for the entire studio, whether they're projects that are currently in development or new IP strategies, um, technology initiatives, uh, what are we doing from a facility standpoint? Maybe we need to find a smaller studio space or, or no studio space at all. Um, we have to figure out how to equip remote team members to be as effective as, and productive as possible. Recruitment initiatives. These, again, are the things that are driving the business of game development, of being a game studio. And so make those very visible. It's that whole idea of transparency, right? And these can be fed on to you know, since the cards can exist in multiple places, these can be fed onto a studio roadmap like this. They now exist in multiple places here in the backlog and also here. I could also drag that onto a, what's called a studio portfolio Kanban, where you're tracking the flow of progress of these very high level initiatives. Um, and anybody coming in to, to see this collection shared across the entire studio can see where each and every one of these studio drivers, business initiative drivers sits. Um, you can also see in this single screen collection, um, maybe uh, the current release plan for a particular game. And you might wanna see that you know, as a timeline or you might wanna see it as a sheet. You can change the view, so to say, of, of each one of these boards on the fly. You could have your other game that's in, in development, its release plan in a sheets view or a Kanban view or a timeline view. You could also see those recruitment initiatives. Um, how are we doing towards recruiting those five game player engineers, for example. We can also bring in um, 
the backlogs, the feature backlogs maybe from the two games that are in development and track their progress directly from the backlogs, thanks to things like statuses and relations, where we can see how these things are progressing. Each one of these features, each one of these epics are progressing towards completion directly from the backlog, directly from this single screen studio dashboard, creating that true kind of studio level agility. All right, so you can really break down the solutions to people or culture, process, and tools. So moving on to process. Um, so if you weren't agile before, basically meaning, you know, one of, one of the key principles of agile is responding to change and adapting to change very rapidly. You certainly have to, to, to make that switch and that mindset change now, right? And, and not just at the team level, but as I said before, at the overall studio level, and I've traveled to hundreds of game studios around the world with Handsoft and then with Favreau and now as an independent coach myself. And I contend that in game development, in game development they were very, we were very early to start using Agile at the team level, but it never really scaled too far above and beyond the team level to the teams of teams and, and to the overall studio and even to the entire you know, maybe if you're electronic arts across the entire larger organization level, the portfolio level. And that's a shame because game development were early adopters of, of Scrum, early adopters of Kanban, early adopters of just agile development in general, but it never really progressed much past, past the team level. And as a remote studio, you know, that has to change. It has, the entire studio has to have this agile mindset, these agile way of working, agile way of working. And, and track the flow of value, not just on the individual team level, but across the entire studio, which you can do quite effectively in a tool like Fabro. You also have to have a studio cadence. So what, what's our, across our teams of teams, right? Uh, what's our release schedule? Or what's our milestone plan? Or when are we gonna have studio-wide check-ins? Or when are we gonna have a teams of team check-ins? And make those, that cadence, repeatable and also make it very visible. Um, again, instead of not just tracking the flow of value at the team level, but tracking that flow of value across the entire studio and making of course that again, very visual. And with a tool like Favro, you can track those metrics, that flow of value, those value-based metrics and flow-based metrics, not only for the team, but for the overall studio and teams of teams. Um, Here's an example of, and if you are gonna have a process, right? Keep it lightweight, keep it organic, keep it flexible. This is uh, the, the coaching framework that I use when I go into game studios, when I go with it, into other types of business. It's very simple, repeatable process. Uh, observe the teams, set the improvement goals, coach the teams to make those improvements, review, adapt. So this is the inspect and adapt piece. Uh, do the review, inspect those changes, observe again, and repeat the overall cycle over and over again. So these short iterations get that you know, customer feedback, whether it's external customers, internal customers, and repeat that cycle as quickly and as often as possible. Now to tools. Um, of course, we're using Zoom. Everybody's using Zoom. We're using Zoom today to, to run this webinar. Great for synchronous meetings, for ad hoc meetings, for standing meetings. Um, Slack has been proven excellent for asynchronous general discussions. Um, not so good for the real time, um, maybe you know, not so good for the asynchronous work base, you know, getting the actual work done discussions. I've worked with studios have, who have tried to run their development out of Slack. It's a nightmare, nobody can find anything. You know, it's spread across a thousand different channels. Um, you, you go back and try to see how a decision was made or, or how a bug was fixed and nobody can find anything, right? So you, you have to, Slack is great for those general discussions, but for actually getting the work done, you need a proper planning and collaboration cloud-based tool like Favro, um, where it's, you can actually communicate where the work is happening. Like you saw in that example where somebody was blocked that, that whole conversation, instead of happening in, in Slack, 
was tied directly to the card where the work was happening. So you're having those conversations, you're communicating in real time where the work is happening, where the work is flowing, so it doesn't get lost. And it's very easy to find no matter where you are in the world trying to collaborate with the other team members. Um, of course, it also is excellent for the planning, the prioritization, and, and of course, the real-time collaboration and flow. So one last example to illustrate this. Uh, maybe you're an art team. This would be maybe an art director, an art lead dashboard where they have their master backlog. Um, they might have pulled in because they need to see in real time what live ops is doing, the live ops backlog, which exists, as you can see here, primarily in a live op ops collection. They've broken down, thanks to the hierarchical nature of Favreau backlogs, they've broken down their deliverables, their art assets, into what are the internal team is going to be working on and what are our external outsource partners going to be working on. We further broke those down into content drops or releases, uh, bundled up characters, bundled up weapons, bundled up cars, environment props, whatever the case may be for each release. And the point that we're trying to get across here is you can track at multiple levels because of the hierarchical nature of the backlog. So I can take the release drops, say characters, for example, and move that over here or, or add that over here. And then you can see thanks to relations, this isn't selected now, but this is now we're going to move this to in progress um, and track the flow at a high level here of each one of these content drops. Maybe this is now in review, for example, and you can see that directly here again from the backlog because this card exists in multiple places. But we can do the same thing for the individual assets, whether being worked on by the internal team or also or, or by the outsource or external team. So I can take this character agent 11, for example, move it over here. We can see it's currently at the concept stage and then move that through to, to sketch. Like you can see here over to illustration like this. So I can track both the high level progress of the entire content drop and also the individual art assets. And I can do the same thing for my external team. And, and even though this is primarily exists on that art external teams collection, so they can only see this board maybe and the art assets you're feeding them like this, you can see it as a as an art director or an art lead or maybe an outsource manager from this dashboard collection and you can see them working on these cards and moving these cards through the different art asset pipeline stages again in real time either directly from the backlog or by bringing that bringing that live real-time board into your dashboard collection to be able to track both you can add custom fields like polish level um, you can add tags like release, so on and so forth. You can do that all in the tool. Okay, so um, as Patrick called out, there's been studios who have been successful. There have been some, unfortunately, that haven't been so successful with this move to remote. Uh, Riot Games, which was a large Favreau customer. Um, I, I believe, and we had Ali Otterson as a guest on earlier in the summer. Um, and I've spoken to people at Riot Games, they attribute a, a big part of their success in moving to, to remote uh, to not only using Favro, but having that very agile kind of trust and accountability culture to begin with, to the point they were able to release not one, but two games during the pandemic. They became a true Riot, Riot Games, plural, during the pandemic, which is, is incredible. And we have other success stories here um, if you go to learn.favro.com customer stories, um, I ran a series of interviews with some of the, again, top game producers, game developers uh, in the world prior to the pandemic. And these are all people who have used the tool both remote and co-located to great success. Uh, so last but not least, um, my company, Brightcove Insights, uh, Favro Agile partner in partnership with Favreau to help game studios make this move to remote more seamless, or if they've struggled with it, uh, help kind of reset, hit the reset button 
and make it a more, much more productive endeavor, maybe truly ditch the physical studio altogether as Unknown Worlds has obviously done. Um, this five day Febro game studio quick start. So the idea is, you know, work with somebody like myself who's been in game development, who's worked with Favro directly as an employee, who has a partnership with Favro now, and we do the heavy lifting for you, both myself and Favro. So uh, it's, a, it's a single price, plus you get the 25% Favro annual discount, and we completely custom design. We sit down with you, you figure out how you optimally want your studio to work, how do you want your teams to collaborate remotely? And we set up and design those collections for you. We help set up the dashboard collections and also the individual automated workflows. Um, we also do all the integrations for you. So you can integrate at the board level, you can integrate at the collection level, and there's pre-built integrations to your existing critical studio applications, such as Slack, maybe you're still using Jira, GitHub, G Suite, et cetera. We'll configure all those integrations for you. It takes out of the pain of doing that. Um, there's more details on this down here. Also help with migration from existing tools to make that, that transition from whatever tools you're currently using for development or tracking development and production much easier. And included is a full day Favro platform master training and certification and a full day Favro Agile game developer training and certification. So this is to master the tool, everything that it can do from an administration and configuration standpoint as well as, as, well as all the capabilities. And this is helps with the culture of adapt, adapting to this Agile mindset, working in more Agile ways, really kind of tracking the flow of value. So it's really a combination of not just the tool, but also the processes you use in that tool that really makes kind of the magic happen, so to say. Then there's some short end user training and onboarding and a communications plan that runs throughout. And then after the launch of Favro for your remote game studio, or even co-located studio, if you do go back to this, the physical location for that matter, um, success tracking and metrics to see are people using the tool? Are people using the tool the way it was intended to, again, help do that inspect and adapt and help improve in the usage of the tool? Here's a timeline um, of exactly how this breaks down from day to day. Again, those integrations and then some more information on the, the training packages. So again, uh, it, it's, it's almost like getting um, an entire game studio if you will, for uh, the, the, the price, uh, you know, the price far less than a physical space, even for a, a single month. So, you know, you move to remote, make Favro your single source of truth, ditch the physical space, and, and you're probably gonna be better off. You're probably gonna be more effective, more creative, more productive. Um, working out of Favro as your, your actual studio, virtual space studio, as opposed to having a physical space. Okay, um, so that is everything from my perspective. And again, thanks for everyone who joined today. Uh, Patrick, thank you very much as usual. And Mike Ferret, you know, huge, Huge props. I learned a ton myself today. Um, thanks for joining us, sharing your insights, sharing your experience. And of course, uh, as I said before at the beginning of this webinar, I'm going to be making this a public collection, which I'll do right now. It's this easy. And I'm going to be sharing this out to everybody who uh, registered for this, everybody who watches this on demand. Uh, we'll get the shared version of this. And again, they can click on any one of these cards and see all these examples, click all of these links, lots of valuable information in there. Okay. Um, if anybody does have questions after the fact, feel free. There's going to be a series of emails that go out to you. Feel free to ask me directly via email, and I will add those to that last board you saw on the 
collection, the Q&A section to share out to everybody. Not only your question, but of course, our answers. So thanks again for joining, and we hope to see you at future events. Cheers.